Well, thanks everyone for sticking around. Uh, I know it's been a long day. Uh, this is my first in-person con in over two years, so I'm pretty excited to be here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so first, we got to thank the sponsors. You know, obviously, without them, uh, a lot of us wouldn't have jobs. <laughs> uh, but we also probably wouldn't have much of the conference without them. So thanks to all of them uh, who are involved. Uh, so I want to talk today about RASP and WAF, um, and, and I'll get into the differences and so on and so forth. But first, I'm David Linder. I'm a CISO at Contract Security. I spent most of my career in application security, uh, mostly consulting, focused primarily in the mobile space, uh, but uh, did a lot of uh, basic apps and consulting um, for years and years. So I want to take us on a little journey, um, talking about our applications and our software. So not, so not some breaking news, our apps are vulnerable. We have lots of them out there, we have a lot of software, and they're all under attack. Um, that should be uh, not a surprise to any of us, uh, and I've got some stats about some of that. So I want to talk about apps real quick, uh, application code makeup. You know, this is a thing that's been talked about for years, you know, we talk about third-party code and all this stuff, um, but when it comes down to an application, about 20% of it is custom code. So that's the code our developers are writing and not pulling from somewhere else. 6% of it is active open source library classes. That means we're actually using that code from the libraries we're pulling in. 49% is inactive open source libraries. So we're pulling a bunch of shit in and none of it's getting used. And then 25% of it is active libraries and classes that aren't even touched. Um, you know, so it's, it's interesting. So if you really break it down, 78% of the code in our applications is active custom code. You know, a lot of times we're like, oh, well, only 20% of it's custom code. Well, all of that's being used for the most part. You know, it's the other stuff we're pulling in. So, you know, talking about applications over time, you know, we've gone through this huge wave of application security and standards and movements and, you know, this really started way back in 1970. Uh, you know, when OWASP came along in the early 2000s, we started doing some WAFs, dynamic scanning, static scanning, you name it. Um, but if you look at the numbers, the average vulnerabilities of an app 21 years ago was about 26. Today is 21. So if you think about that, it's about 1% or so. So it's another 100 years before we get to zero. Um, we're not making great strides. And why that's important, we'll get to that in a minute. So, we're under attack. Uh, the latest uh, data we have is about 10,000 attacks per application every single month um, that these apps are seeing attacks come at them. But the weird thing is, is only about 99.8% of those aren't even like hitting vulnerabilities. But break that down, that's still a lot. Say there's 4 million attacks, that's about 800, or 8,000, sorry, 8,000 actual exploited vulnerabilities. You know, so this breaks it down by vulnerability type. You know, you can have access to the slide deck if you want to look at it. Um, and then there's some, some likelihoods that, you know, based on the number of attacks we see versus if your application's actually vulnerable to it, it kind of changes the picture a little bit. Uh, so, you know, you look at this here and you can see that the likelihood of your application having uh, a command injection vulnerability is point that's the likelihood of even having a vulnerability. But all of the attacks, 51% likelihood that you're going to be attacked for command injection, even though you're probably already vulnerable. So we have all this weird data, and we haven't really known what to do with it. Um, and at the same time, we have this thing that I like to call a software security crisis. You know, we have you know, specialized security staff. We have very few of them. Uh, we have our specialized tools, and there's thousands of them out there. Um, but we're still writing more and more code. It's faster and faster and faster. I think the, the last stat I saw, on average, the professional developer writes about 10,000 lines of brand new code every single year. Uh, and there's like 30 million professional developers in the world. Start adding all that up. We're, we're becoming, uh, we're getting to a problem. The latest results from uh, BSIM, so Build Security and Maturity Model, does uh, a lot of good work for a lot of organizations is that there's only one application security expert for every 159 developers. So if you add all that up, that's 10,000 times 159, and one person is supposed to re or look at all that new code every year, plus all the old stuff, it's not feasible. So 
early on, we had a problem. You know, what, what problem were we facing? Well, the problem was is we knew network security, or at least we thought we did. And we firewalled and, you know, we blocked everything. Uh, but then web apps kind of came along, we're like, oh, well, we got to open these big holes in our firewall uh, for ports 80 and 443. And it was a big thing. Uh, there was a lot of infighting. I remember this. This was uh, a long time ago. That's aging me a bit. Um, and it allows all traffic to those applications. Right? So it's just wide open holes uh, in our firewall. And so web application security was kind of boring. Um, and we weren't sure what to do with it. So what did we do? Well, we knew firewalls. So we built one for web. We called it a web application firewall, or WAF. Anyone here use them? Couple? Cool. Most of us do, and we may not even know it. Uh, AWS and Azure and all of them kind of have some of that built in. So we built this web application firewall with the same sort of reasoning that we have other firewalls. Um, way back in 2002, really, was kind of the first WAF. Mod Security was born. Um, and, and we started using that to help protect those wide open gaps in our regular network firewalls. Um, and we'll talk about that. So what is a web application firewall? Well, it's at layer seven. It's used to stop scanning potential attacks against that application layer, okay? Um, you can tune it, but it requires a lot of tuning, a lot of patching. Uh, there's a lot of noise involved with web application firewalls. Um, you know, a lot of alerts things that we tend to ignore. Uh, does anyone use their WAF data for threat hunting or anything like that? Or they just kind of let it run? That's usually the response I get. We don't, we don't even use the data uh, because there's just so much of it. So how does it actually work? So real high level. Say I have an input box on my web page uh, and it expects some data. I'm going to submit it. In this case, it's a name. But I'm going to put something in there, a like contrast or one equals one, dash, dash, which is a very well-known, I'm just going to see if this is a SQL injection endpoint uh, and see what happens. Well, a WAF is going to look at that. It's going to run some regular expressions, and it's going to score it and most likely block it. It's say, hey, this is a SQL injection attack. It shouldn't be allowed. Uh, similarly, the same form Maybe I'm going to change it because that's being blocked. I'm going to try command injection attacks. I'm going to try semicolon, cat, Etsy password, and see what happens. Similarly to the last attack, contrast or one equals one, the WAF is going to block it. However, should it? Does it ever result in a SQL query? Does it ever result in an actual system command on the other end? The WAF doesn't know that. It has no context. It's outside of the application. So I have this analogy um, that is terrible, but uh, it's about this new thing at the, the zoo. Uh, there's this firewall fence uh, in the monkey cage. And so we want to tune this firewall fence to allow just bananas to go through and block anything else, right? So easy peasy out of the box, it blocks everything except bananas. But as you can imagine, uh, we want to tune it at some point. But how does it determine what's different? Well, there's a lot of different ways it does this, right? But for the most part, if I roll it all up, what a WAF does is it runs a bunch of regular expressions on the data coming in. You know, in this case, I have some here for some JavaScript, some iframe, different uh, HTML uh, entities and such. Um, and then it will score it. The scoring mechanisms are kind of all over the place, usually from like one to five or one to seven. Um, and then it may block it or may not. Um, but it's very, very hard, and there tends to be a lot of bypasses. You know, one of the ones that's commonly used is an on event, a JavaScript on event. Um, a lot of the very common ones are blocked, but this changes all the time. I haven't looked recently, but the last time I looked, there were 374 on events, depending on which browser you use. So now a laugh has to be tuned to block all the ones that matter, and it doesn't really have context, and it can result in a lot of false positives. So, you know, if I want to tune it, maybe I want to allow some more things because it's blocking things that shouldn't. If you imagine, uh, say it starts uh, querying on the single quote, that someone, O'Leary or someone has a very Irish single quote last name, uh, and it blocks it, they're going to be upset, rightfully so. But, so now we have to tune the WAF to stop doing that because that's an actual name and it needs to get through and it needs to be put in the database. 
So how do you tune it? This is where it really gets difficult. This is one rule for tuning your laugh. Uh, I'm not going to read through it uh, because I don't even understand all of it. Uh, but this is a, a mod security rule that, that really is for command injection uh, to, to stop certain different command injection attacks. So there's applying these rules, and then there's the vendors of the laughs that will give you patches and things like that, which is basically just these rules that you have to apply to your laugh. But the problem is always been it's very easy to buy apples. You know, so what if it looks like an apple? Even though I want to allow apples, should I allow rotten apples? You know, and so you start getting into these really big problems uh, with the laugh, and, and you can see here on the right, maybe, uh, that's all the patches that were applied in a single day um, by a friend of mine on, on their lab. Different CVEs that, that were released, that vendor said, hey, you need to apply all these patches. So you have all this alert fatigue, you have pat patching fatigue, it's gonna stop real traffic in a lot of cases, um, but it is very helpful. I mean, it is really good at XSS, it is really good at SQL injection, on the front end, but realize there's always going to be bypasses. And there's some interesting ones. Uh, you know, there's different Unix commands and things where you can, you know, add the, the question mark or the dollar sign uh, and it will bypass labs. Uh, you know, there's there's been some with XSS with the on events. I mean, that's really, in every bug bounty program I've been involved in, it's always an on event that someone tries to use to get past a lab or some, you know, internal uh, mechanism to, to validate that input. Uh, and then SQL injection, I've learned a lot about SQL injection uh, in the recent years, and there are so many ways. Uh, you know, a, a slash, star, star, slash is the same as a space uh, to SQL, uh, and it will actually bypass laughs as well. One recent one in the news, and Jared actually talked about this a couple of talks ago, was the, conf the most recent Confluence CD. Uh, the original reporters of this CD needed to change the word eval and the single quote because it was being blocked by the laugh of VMware where they were trying to attack. So all they did is they Unicode encoded it, uh, and instead of eval, it's the Unicode value of E and val, and then the Unicode value of single quote, and were able to quickly bypass that laugh and then prove their exploit on confluence. So while laughs are important, we all have to realize that they do have some issues when it comes to Bypass. So in comes RAS, or Runtime Application Self-Protection. I would say this is still a very new technology. You know, it's been around for probably six or seven years, um, but it's not fully mainstream yet. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. We'll get into that. Um, so Runtime Application Self-Protection is also a Layer 7 um, technology used to stop those attacks on the application. Uh, it doesn't require tuning for the most part, just based on the way it works, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, and the alerting is very low because the, the, the way it works uh, inside the application, there's a very low false positive rate. So the alerts typically are something you need to react to. So the three different things uh, from a laugh are it, it can see into the application. It is running in the live application. It instruments the code, it watches data flow, and it is inside that app. So it has context, something the WAF does not have. You know, since it's in the application, security can be enabled anywhere your code is running. So anywhere that code is, it can be enabled. Throwing a WAF in front of everything doesn't always work well, especially if there's microservices involved and it's service-to-service -service interaction. You're not going to throw a WAF in between all of those. It's just not feasible. <clears throat> and intelligence. It monitors security like we do performance. You know, we all use some sort of performance monitoring system uh, with an agent that runs inside of our applications and gives us data where bad performing code might be. Same sort of thing here. And it uses instrumentation. You know, instrumentation has been around forever. Uh, in the real world, it's used to build very complex things. We don't build cars, we don't build airplanes, we don't build any of those sorts of things without, without instrumenting them. You need to know how fast you're going. Can you imagine driving a car with no instrumentation. You'd have no clue how fast you're going, how fast you should be going. Uh, you don't know what oil changes do because you don't know how many miles you've gone. Um, it's, it, it'd be terrible, you know? And, and now it's getting to the point where it's like the car is yelling at you when your tire pressure is low. 
And, and it's amazing, you know, I, I'm not driving down the road and having someone point out the window like we used to and say, hey, your tire's low. <laughs> you know, I had that before in high school. So how does RASP work different? Uh, so RASP works, on the outside it feels similar, but it works differently. So let's go back to the original example. So I have that same form where I need to submit a name, and I submit contrast or one equals one dash dash. So what the RASP is going to do, it's going to look at that and, and it's going to key on it and say, oh wow, this is something we need to look at. This is something we need to watch and see where it ends up. So once it traces it through the app and that ends up in a SQL query, now the RASP is going to say, oh geez, we have a problem here, we need to block it. So there's context. The application has uh, allowed RASP to follow that data into a vulnerable, what we call a sync, and I'll talk about that in a second. And so it says, hey, we can't allow this to happen, it blocks it, and, and doesn't allow that attack to function. So if I do something similar with the uh, command injection, and I, I submit the semicolon cat Etsy password, this is where the big difference is. Since the end of this, the sync, is a SQL query, RASP is not going to do anything with it. It says, oh, well, maybe you want to put that in the database. It's not a big deal. It's not actually running a system command. So I'm not going to block it, I'm not going to do anything with it, because it has the context. So this is how it can be very low, false positive, very low, low alert. So let's dig in a little deeper. <clears throat> so the way that a RASP works is that it starts at a source. So where data comes in, which is typically like a get parameter. It's coming from an HTTP request, could be a header, could be a cookie, could be parameters, you know, could, be, could be any part of that request. Um, so there's a source, you know, so in this case, I've said, okay, there's a get parameter, there's a source, source value uh, of user, you know, very, very simple. So now I've marked, I said, okay, RASP, you need to follow this data to the sync, which is the next piece. So there's the source, and now I need to know where it's going out. Like, where is this data being used at the end? Is it committing a SQL statement? Is it a system query? Is it returning that value to the user, a la XSS? Um, and then once I understand that, hey, it's come in as a source, it's tainted, it's untrusted data, and now it's going out in this sink uh, that is running a SQL query, and there's nothing in between to say, hey, I've parameterized it, I've validated it, or any of that, I can officially say that there's a SQL injection issue uh, and move on from there. But RASP digs in a little bit deeper. So let's say we have this uh, example. And I have a username of test at example.com, and or one equals one, and all of that, and some password. The prototypical SQL injection attack from years and years ago that used to work on about every website. So the way that RASP looks at this, uh, and the way it works, is it basically says, okay, I have this input, there's some things in there that are interesting. So, you know, or one equals one maybe, maybe the semicolon dash dash. So it does a little bit of regular expression to say, this is interesting, I'm gonna follow it. I'm gonna follow it to where it ends up. So, in this case, I mark it, I'm gonna follow it, and it ends up in a SQL query. So now what I can do to be extremely accurate is I can tokenize what that SQL query is supposed to be. You say, well, this SQL query is supposed to have from a user ID, and then nothing after that. There should be no more uh, tokens or operations or anything after that point. I should have a string and that's it. So if I see something else outside of that, so I've broken some boundary, the RASP can be 100% accurate and say, oh geez, we have a problem here and I'm going to block it. So this happens even before the query is made to the back end. You know, so in this case here, you can see that it broke it down. The RASP is going to break that SQL query down to all the different components of that query and realize, because it knows what the query should be. It already knows the different pieces and parts of that query should be. And if there's more there, it's gonna block it. As simple as that. So it takes that untrusted user input, that sync is called an execute query, we analyze that query, we tokenize it, and then some alert is sent somewhere saying, hey, we blocked this, this is bad. So remember how you had to tune a laugh. Well, tuning a RASP looks like this. It's either on or it's off, for the most part. 
There are cases where you can add validators and sanitizers, but we're getting way into the weeds when we start talking about that. But for the most part, you turn it on and you turn it on. Now, I don't want to sit here and say it's rainbows and sunshines, because you know, the reality is, is RASP is still pretty new. It still has some issues. Uh, it's very language and framework specific. You can imagine, you know, I had to know that that execute query is something I need to key on. And that's very specific to Java and whatever uh, framework was being used in that case. But you can imagine if I'm using Spring, if I'm using all these other languages and frameworks, RASP has to be updated for that because it's running in the actual application. You know, any sort of bypass, because there's no perfect security tool, um, does usually result in a code change, which is a little bit harder than applying a patch to a lab. It is a little more difficult to install, uh, depending on how your system works. Um, and oftentimes, which for some odd reason, uh, I've been in security long enough and I feel it, when we don't see anything in security, we question it, don't we? Like if we get no results on something, we're like, oh geez, this must not be functioning. But oftentimes, a RASP isn't going to see anything. It's only going to see something when it's an actual attack that would have hit an actual vulnerable sink. So a lot of times, it's pretty silent, which is hard for us to accept. So what does it look like? So let's go back to Confluence. So this is really it. You know, that Confluence CVE that was used, uh, the, the attackers had to bypass the lab of the, the report where they reported it to, uh, was just picked up by a RASP. Easy peasy, you know, we, we had a RASP running on Confluence. I said, hey, this is an expression language injection attack. Uh, we're going to block it. No configuration needed, none of that. So even though it bypassed the laugh, the RASP caught it. RASP is already a standard, whether most of you know it or not, it is 853. It's also in the, the most recent PCI. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. So that's some background on those two. So let's compare them. Okay. So my research team decided we'd kind of look at laugh and rasp and compare them a little bit. And this is at a high level is what we're looking at, right? You have your payloads, you have your laugh, and you have your dummy application. You have your payloads, and then you have your dummy app with rasp running into it. And you can quickly see where context is lost with the laugh, and you have full context when you're in the rasp. But here's the problem. Uh, we were working with a bunch of companies uh, for, for doing this. And one of them returned this. They said, okay, what we did is we stood up this application, we ran some scans against a laugh and against a, a, a RASP, and here's the block count. What does this tell me? What does it tell you? You may not be able to see that in the back. I can tell you what it tells me, nothing. This is just, it's an odd thing. There, there, there are two technologies that we've made similar, but they're different. Uh, and results like block count are meaningless for RASP because if it's not a vulnerable sync, you're not going to get a block count. So if you're expecting a block count, you're really expecting the RASP to behave like a laugh, which it won't because it's not made to, um, and we're gonna run into problems. You know, so the results are all over the place. Like I first looked at this and I'm like, oh, interesting. The RASP caught more than the laugh, but why? And then I start questioning, like, what laugh did you use? Were they vulnerable? What were the, the scans like? You know, so testing mes methods are inconsistent, um, and the results like this don't really mean a lot because it's two completely different technologies. It'd be like an antivirus and an XDR. I mean, they're really, really different technologies. So we took it a little bit further. We're like, all right, well, what are these people using to scan their applications? Um, and compare the two. So we looked at you know, XSS radar, XSS scanner, all sorts of different things, SQL map, and we started just blasting through all of this stuff. And, and we realized that all of these tools, all these uh, payload testing tools are, are pretty poor. Uh, XSS, there's 20% of the XSS attacks are either not valid or duplicates, 27% on SQL injection, 48% command injection, and path reversal was even worse. 82% of the path reversal attacks were not valid or duplicates. So we're using flawed data, we're testing two different technologies the same way, expecting the same results. Uh, so we're, we're causing this really weird 
mentality uh, that we shouldn't have. So to me, it's having different data and having that visibility through the data that's important. So this is what most of us have today. So the, the three or four hands that went up with a laugh, you probably have a laugh today. And it's maybe throwing that data into a sim. It didn't seem like anyone's actually using it for anything uh, because maybe we trust that it's doing its job and we're applying patches and, and whatever else. But again, we're still not sure how any of these things would have impacted that running application. Now, that being said, there are some things that left as well. Uh, you know, being where it is, it can really prevent some DDoS attacks, it can block some of the IP addresses and stuff much more quickly and further out than maybe a RASP can. And then if you look at the, the actual difference here with RASP data, you can throw it into a SIM and then you can tie it back directly to uh, the security vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, so in the case of Confluence, you know, we could have taken that data from the RASP, handed it to the developers and said, hey, we have a problem here, we should probably patch this, fix this uh, expression language issue that we have. So it's just a different place to, to get that data out of the system. So I propose we use both. They're two completely different things at two different places in the network. Uh, and as a security person, we're all about control layers, right? You know, and having different pieces of the onion. And to me, these are two different control layers. You have the WAF on the external, it's really good at certain things, and you have the RASP running in the application with context. And the reason, the, the big reason why, is because hackers are exploiting the lag. And what I mean by that is how quickly can us as WAF providers, and, you know, us as people who are maintaining our labs, respond in a case like uh, Equifax? which is, is, is this here. There was a, a CVE for uh, patching struts. Um, with a, a RASP, you don't really have to do anything. It's already there protecting you against those sorts of attacks. With a laugh, I now have to patch it, and, and the attackers are going to exploit that lag. In the case of Equifax, the lag was huge, right? March 7th, there was a CVE released, um, and then not till mid-May, uh, they were breached. They still hadn't upgraded or fixed anything. And then they finally learned of the breach at the end of July. So there's a huge lag there, but they never would have had a problem if they would have been using both a WAF and a RASP. You know, if just a WAF wouldn't have blocked these attacks. Same thing in the case of Confluence. If I was running Confluence on premise, which would be dumb, but there are a lot of people that are doing it, uh, specifically government, um, I would look at running a WAF and a RASP in that COTS product because I don't have the ability to make changes to that code, and I don't know exactly where the issues are, and there are just some things like expression language injection that a WAF is not very good at blocking, and a RASP can. So the way I look at it is this. I want to prevent and protect. You know, when I'm driving my car, when we buy cars today, they all have to, A, have an airbag, and B, have seatbelts, right? It's two different things for two different uses. That seatbelt is annoying sometimes if you hit the brake a little hard, isn't it? Just like a laugh, you get all these weird alerts and things like that. But that airbag, you're usually hitting something when those go off, right? And they help prevent you from getting much more damage than maybe you would. Um, and it's the same thing with this. You know, you have the laugh for that, that front gate entry system, and you have the RASP to cover you um, when that laugh fails. So, to really close this out, I wanted to bring up the, the strengths and weaknesses of both and why I think they work very well together. Uh, I know I mentioned them through this whole thing, um, but a laugh, the weaknesses are really the alert fatigue. False positive, false negatives are, are always there. You know, it's interesting, I do a lot of bug crowd and hacker one, and there's been quite a few times where companies be like, all right, see if you can bypass the laugh. And they only do it for two days. You want to know why? Because they get so many bypasses, uh, they, they run through money. <laughs> um, you know, patching and tuning is required almost on a daily basis, and there's no actionable results, right? We're not looking at the data because there's really no, no action I can take. I can't hand WAF data to a developer and say, hey, go fix your code, because I don't know if it's broken. I just know that someone's scanning that app with malicious intent. So the RASP strength opposed to that, it's very accurate. 
often has no results, very little tuning required. And the results are actually, you can actually hand the results to a developer and ask them to fix the issue at hand. Or work with your security team and be like, all right, hey, we have RASP running, we're happy, uh, we can push out that remediation six months or whatever it is. However, the RASP weaknesses are counteracted very strongly with the last strengths. RASP does have performance impacts. It's running in the application. It's doing, it's using instrumentation. And the impacts are typically between zero and 10%. That's a lot of performance if you're talking bigger websites, bigger applications. 10% is usually hard to swap. Uh, language and framework specific, it's a must. You know, so you, I have seen every language and framework possible, um, and it's very hard to, to find a RASP that works with all of them. Um, and it's not always environment aware, right? Because it's running in the app, it doesn't have any context outside of that. All I know is that this data came in, and I'm going to follow it through the app. But the last strengths uh, counteracting those is performance is not an issue. Labs have been around for 20 plus years. They've gotten really performant. Uh, there's language agnostic rules. Uh, it doesn't matter what the language is because it doesn't, it's not context, there's no context, it's just looking at the data. Um, and it's more environment aware. So it's able to block IP addresses, it's able to prevent DDoS attacks uh, at that level uh, rather than trying to get those sorts of things into the app. So that's everything. I flew through this because it's the last talk of the day and everyone's probably uh, chopping at the bit. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I can get as technical as you want. Um, yeah. Go for it. Sciences, um, but they were acquired, but they were more of a, what they call themselves an NG laugh, you know, <laughs> kind of in between. Uh, contrast security where I work, I don't want to throw uh, that at you, but uh, we have what I would consider a true rat, rat. Um And then there's, gosh, I can't remember what, there was one other that was also recently acquired, but it was more like an NG laugh. Um, and it, but it did run more in the system. There's actually a free one. If you're okay with downloading uh, um, stuff from Chinese folks, uh, it, it's very good though. It's, I think it's called Baidu, B-A-I-D-U. Um, they've got a lot of, it's, it's on GitHub, uh, very, very good. But, but again, since it's so language and framework specific, it only works on a couple, you know? So uh, it's, it's definitely an interesting technology. I would say it'll probably be another, I don't know, three to five years before it gets to the point where it's, more mainstream, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got a lot of work to go. I mean, the performance impacts is really the biggest deal since it's running. But, you know, memory and all that stuff is just getting bigger and better by the day, too. Uh, so hopefully we can, uh, we can get a little bit better with it. So uh, the other question was uh, regarding JavaScript. So main injection, SQL injection, please say this how you get That's a great question. Um, if, I, if I had my way, it wouldn't touch any of it. Um, and, and the reason is, is because in my opinion, those are better caught by a laugh than a RASP because it's so difficult to know, okay, I've got this data coming in, it's being encoded and decoded 28 times, it's going out in these 17 different places, maybe it's being committed to a database. Um, so it's more of a front-end technology with a RASP where it's doing mostly regular expressions for the XSS types of stuff, just because it's easier. Um, and, and, I mean, if, if you really dig into even a WAF and a RASP and XSS specifically, it's actually really easy to key in on an XSS attack. Um, it's just hard to keep up with the changing HTML and JavaScript landscape. That's the piece that's the hard part. Especially with all the Yes, yes. Thankfully, we're talking to Jason most of the time, so now it's just client-side stuff. 
Yeah. What was the ECI uh, ESS reference requirement? I think I read that from like 91. Uh, it's, it, I think it's just 31, which is the, the recent. Uh, 91, yeah. SSS 91. Okay. okay. Anything else? Great, thanks. Thanks again for attending. Um, got about uh, 29 minutes.